Yes, uh, I'm going to turn this over to our debate moderator today, uh, Ms. Sean Boyd. An informative and probably lively debate here today. I want to go over the ground rules real quickly here. Um, we're going to have opening statements from both gentlemen here, um, 10 minutes each, and then we'll be hitting on uh, different topics. And in each topic area, I'll be asking each of them a question and they will each have five minutes to answer that question. There may be some follow-up questions depending on the answers. Um, and then I will ask questions for 20 minutes and then we'll have questions from you all um, for 20 minutes and then closing remarks. Um, want to go over who we have here today. Sean, can, you, can I get out of here by uh, 420? I've got some problems. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. All right, thank you. All right. We've got um, to my left, Mr. Rob Corey. Rob is an attorney and principal of the Law Office of Corey and Associates, specializing in litigation, criminal defense, civil rights, and cannabis law. Mr. Corey has litigated numerous criminal and civil cases related to cannabis, in particular winning law civil lawsuits against the state of Colorado and local entities that struck down limitations on medical marijuana dispensaries. And he has won multiple criminal jury trials to legitimize the free market in cannabis and its leaders. Mr. Corey assisted in drafting Amendment 64, which legalized, as you know, recreational pot in Colorado. Um, and he says, protects and regulates adult use of cannabis and industrial hemp, which voters passed in 2012. Mr. Corey previously served as counsel to the U.S. House of Representatives Judiciary Committee. He graduated from Stanford Law School and from the University of Colorado Boulder. Welcome. Thank you, and thank you for having me. To my me. right, Jeff Hunt. Jeff is the pre Vice President of Public Policy for Colorado Christian University and Director of the University's think tank, the Centennial Institute. Jeff earned his BA degrees in Philosophy and Religious Studies from Westmont College, Master of Divinity from Fuller Theological Seminary, and Master of Political Management from George Washington University. He has served as media coordinator for the Senate Republican Conference, Director of Operations of the Clapham Group, Special Assistant to Senator Rick Santorum in his 2012 White House bid, and Director of Colorado Coalitions for Mitt Romney's 2012 presidential campaign. He was the founder of Avanova Media Group, a digital media marketing firm based in Colorado. Jeff is a former river and mountain guide, and he loves to be outdoors, and he and his wife, Nicole, have four children. All right, great. let's get started. Rob, do you wanna open? Sure, I will do that. Um, and first of all, thank you so much for moderating this, yeah. and, and thank you, Jeff, for holding this fine event and this beautiful facility here and thank you for allowing me to be here. Um, I guess, why don't we start, uh, you know, we're at Colorado Christian University. Let's just start with the beginning. Genesis, God created marijuana. He did. There's no dispute that God created cannabis, that it grows on God's earth. In fact, Genesis chapter one, verse 29 said, and God said, behold, I've given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of the earth and every tree. God says this in his word. Now, some people might believe that the Bible's been over-translated and just is a symbolic interpretation. Others believe that it's the literal word of God. Cannabis is an herb bearing seed in all forms. It grows naturally. Moving forward from Genesis, the beginning of, of all existence, to every human culture that has ever existed on the face of the planet, Greeks, Romans, Europeans, Asians, Africans, South Americans, Egyptians, all of the great civilizations, every single great civilization of all time, none of them have decided to prohibit cannabis. None of them until the United States of America, which professes to be a free country, have decided to ban this plant that God created. So we are the outliers here in the United States. We invented the idea of, interestingly, alcohol prohibition. And you're going to hear a couple comparisons to alcohol prohibition in the next hour and a half, I think, at least for me. Um, we invented that concept of alcohol prohibition. And we invented the concept of marijuana prohibition. 
And there has not been a government policy for the past 70 years when marijuana prohibition was created around 1937 in the United States that has been more of an abject, utter failure. It has failed to accomplish any of the goals of it. It has failed to limit demand in any way. In fact, it's increased it. Americans are rebellious people. If the government tells us don't smoke something, what are we gonna do? That's what we do. Let's talk a little bit about the history of prohibition because that, that is highly relevant and important to how we get here. The history of marijuana prohibition dates back to, like I said, after alcohol prohibition, the 30s, William Randolph Hearst, who owned the paper industry, the DuPont family, and then Secretary of Treasury, wealthiest man in the country, Andrew Mellon, who was heavily invested in nylon, all decided we have to eliminate the hemp plant. And I'm talking about industrial hemp, not the fun stuff, the industrial stuff that, that doesn't get you high and, and nobody disputes that. It doesn't get you high. But it is a miraculous industrial product that outcompetes plastic and outcompletes paper. The Declaration of Independence of this nation, the birthing document of our country, was written on hemp paper. Our founding fathers grew hemp. George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, James Madison, indisputable that these men grew cannabis on their plantations. The men who founded this country and wrote a document of Declaration of Independence written on paper that is now illegal under the laws of this country. The Declaration of Independence is illegal in the United States of America. That is how absurd these current laws are. They must end. Nobody, nobody of goodwill and intelligence believes that the federal government of the United States of America engaged in a global war against radical terrorism should be involved with marijuana prohibition. Nobody can truly, honestly believe that the government of the United States of America should have the power to break down your front door, come into your house with armed assault weapons, and rip a joint out of your hand. And I think we'll hopefully gain some uh, common ground here. That is what the law of the United States of America is right now. It allows the government to do that. It can do that. It can get a search warrant. And it's all illegal federally. All of this. The joint that may or may not be in my pocket here is illegal federally. Every gram of marijuana that exists in Colorado or anywhere else is a violation of federal law. That's wrong. So we've heard a lot today, and I attended part of this conference, which, by the way, was excellent. It was, and I learned a lot, and I, I'm saying that sincerely. Um, there were some great speakers. Most of these people are self-professed conservatives, small government, personal responsibility, leave me alone, Ronald Reagan type supporters. Well, Ronald Reagan put it better than I ever could. He said, government is not the solution to the problem. Government is the problem. And government is the problem with marijuana prohibition that has failed to accomplish anything good and itself has accomplished a lot of bad things. And you know, I, I actually agree with the Reverend Pat Robertson. The Reverend Pat Robertson said, we should treat marijuana the way we treat alcohol. This war on drugs just hasn't succeeded. So I guess Mr. Hunt is joining with Hillary Clinton in supporting marijuana prohibition, and I, our side, is embracing the Reverend Pat Robertson who said this. <laughs> now, what is going on in Colorado? First of all, Colorado is the world example of a responsible, regulated cannabis industry. Are we perfect? Of course we're not perfect. We don't shed 70 years of prohibition without making mistakes. And by the way, most of the mistakes were made by government, overtaxing it, over-regulating it, regulating it more than plutonium is regulated in our state. We are the most taxed product ever in the history of Colorado. We pay higher taxes than anyone else. I guess uh, the other side supports high taxes. We are against high taxes. We're, we're, we, we want them to be lowered. They must be lowered. That is to concede a large mistake that Colorado has made and every other jurisdiction that's regulated this. Colorado is held up as the model. This is a multi-billion dollar industry in this state. This is an industry that creates tens of thousands of good jobs. Families feed 
their children from our marijuana industry in Colorado. And I'm going to call it marijuana. It's actually, it's not even marijuana. Marijuana is a made up word, made up in 1937 to demonize this hemp plant in order to open the door for the nylon and plastics and paper industries owned by, owned by those who demonized it. So we here in Colorado have this brand new industry that uh, was technically created in 2001 when we legalized medical marijuana. And from 2001 until 2012, we had legalized medical marijuana. We had a very viable industry just in medical marijuana. And the most important thing about the medical marijuana industry is that tens of thousands of people who needed relief from cannabis got it. I wish you could see the, the people that I've seen in my career as, as a cannabis attorney. I wish you could look into their eyes. I wish you could see people weeping from how cannabis has saved their lives. They're addicted to opiates, addicted to synthetic pills, in extreme pain. And, and, and a few of them are, yes, children. There, there are children who benefit from medical marijuana. There are adults who benefit from medical marijuana. There are elderly people who benefit from it. There are veterans who have served in our wars, who have given their limbs, who have had their legs blown off. They come back to this country and they have to move to Colorado to, to get relief from those injuries. This is the only thing that works for thousands of people. I've seen them out there. I've heard their stories. I believe them. It works. That's why the voters voted medical marijuana in. And that's why once we had a medical marijuana industry, the voters said, the sky didn't fall. There's a dispensary all over the place in our state, not, not in every town. Some towns didn't have them, some did. But they realized, if, if, if we can do this for medical, we can do this for adult use. Adults in America ought to be able to make our own decisions. I, I don't know if you're gonna keep me uh, on track for time. I, I tend to go on, I've got a lot about, more, a lot more things to left. say. about a minute left. All right, thank you. So in conclusion, these are, these are the areas of common ground that I, that I hope to reach with Jeff Hunt, who I think is reasonable. I do think that, all right? And I'm not trying to patronize him or anything like that. First of all, I, I think, I hope we can agree, let's end prison for marijuana. Let's just, let's stop putting people in cages for this so-called crime, if it's gonna remain a crime. Maybe we can agree on that. Maybe we can agree, and there is this distinct concept of industrial hemp. It's completely different from marijuana, the, the kind that, that gives you an effect. Industrial hemp, you get no mental intoxication or, or any kind of euphoria from it. Um, it, it, is a, it is distinct in Amendment 64. It's glossed over, and it has infinite benefits for our economy. I hope we can agree that we, we need to separate those concepts. Third, I hope we can agree that free market capitalism, I hope this room, this gathering, this organization can agree that free market capitalism is the best economic system there is. And if we agree on that, then we agree that's the best way to produce, regulate, and distribute marijuana. Free market capitalism, not prohibition. I hope we can agree that marijuana taxes shouldn't be too high. That's, that's a, a fourth area of common ground that I hope we can build on. They're too high, it creates a black market. That is economics 101, friends. You tax something too high, there's a gray market or black market ready to go. And in this case, a 70 year old gray market or black market. We need to wrap it up. All right, and my final area of commonality that I'd like to get, and I, I've got five kids myself, so um, we, we can agree on that. I hope we can agree that parents are better parents than the government ever will be no matter how hard the government tries. Thank you. Right. Thank you. <laughs> Provocative opening statement, Jeff. Yep. Great. All right, buckle your seatbelts. Here we go. <laughs> Marijuana is a clear and present danger to the people of Colorado. Nearly every promise the marijuana industry made prior to legalization was a lie. Instead, drug dealers wearing suits, now marijuana millionaires have flooded our communities with drugs creating big tobacco, 2.0. They have hooked a generation of people, especially young people and minorities, on a drug that will have devastating impacts for generations to come. Here's the bottom line. 
Colorado is worse off because of recreational marijuana. In nearly every metric, Colorado is worse off. Proponents of marijuana legalizations are seeking to legalize a third American drug, if not more. The cost to society of alcohol and tobacco outweigh the benefits. We spend hundreds of millions of tax dollars, if not billions of dollars, seeking to reduce alcohol and tobacco consumption. Yet m marijuana millionaires seek to introduce a third drug into society. Friends, this is not about decriminalization, it's about commercialization. They wanna get as many people hooked on their drug as they can for profit. Has marijuana had such a negative impact? Let's look at the facts. Number one, safety of children. The safety of young people has been severely compromised. Not just in Colorado, but any state that legalizes recreational or medicinal marijuana has higher youth use rates than states that don't. We've seen an overall increase in youth use rates in Colorado since medicinal and recreational marijuana have been legalized. We're still number one or number two, based upon the study you look at, for youth use rates in the country by nearly every measure. We know for a fact that marijuana harms developing brains. Even the American Psychological Association has condemned use of marijuana by young people for its harmful effects on the brain. We know it lowers IQ. Yet the marijuana industry just this past month, over three and a half years after it became recre recreationally legal, agreed not to make marijuana-laced edibles that look like children's candy. Frankly, if these drug, drug dealers in suits gave a damn about youth consumption, they would have never created marijuana-laced children's candy to begin with. Teens, like use, teens that use marijuana are three times more likely to drink, 26 times more likely to use illicit drugs, and 37 times more likely to smoke tobacco. One in six teens who smoke marijuana will become addicted to it. Let's move on now to personal health. Science has demonstrated that marijuana devastates your body. Chronic use of smoked marijuana is associated with increased risks of cancer, lung damage, bacterial pneumonia, and poor pregnancy outcomes. One recent study from Harvard Medical School found marijuana smokers increased their risk of heart attack five times over that of non-smokers. Marijuana users have a higher risk of stroke compared to people who do not use the drug. Some doctors are beginning to connect marijuana consumption with long-term brain damage, including possibly Alzheimer's disease. The Institute of Medicine, American Society of Addiction Medicine, American Medical Association, American Cancer Society, American Academy of Pediatrics, the National Multiple Sclerosis Society, the American Glaucoma Society, and the American Academy of Ophthalmology all agree that smoked marijuana as medicine administered by various states is unacceptable. Now my opponents may challenge certain studies, but here is something they cannot deny. There is no study that says marijuana is good for you. Let's move on to the safety of our communities. We were promised by the marijuana industry that legalizing, regulating, and commercializing marijuana would eliminate the black market. It's simply false. Even by their own touted estimates, 27% of all money spent in Colorado on marijuana is still being spent on the black market. That's over a quarter, nearly a third. Just this past week, it was reported by Channel 7 that drug enforcement agency agents across Colorado are dealing with a growing problem, a surge of illegal grows in rural parts of the state. Documents show agents are seeing a jump of about 50% in illegal grows across rural areas. Our own Attorney General Cynthia Kaufman said the criminals are still selling on the black market. We have plenty of cartel activity in Colorado and plenty of illegal activity that has not decreased at all. Safety on the roads. According to the NHTSA data, those who tested positive for alcohol and fatal crashes from 2013 to 2015 grew 17% from 129 to 151. By contrast, the number of drivers who tested positive for marijuana in fatal accidents jumped 145% from 47 in 2013 to 115 in 2016. During that time, the prevalence of testing drivers for marijuana use did not change. Bottom line, more people are smoking pot and driving and killing fellow Coloradans. Harms to social services. We've had a rise in homelessness in Colorado linked to the legalization and commercialization of marijuana, an increase in emergency room visits, more marijuana in our schools, an increase in petty crime. All of these cost taxpayer dollars and increases government involvement in our communities. 
Harm to business. Colorado business leaders complain about how difficult it is to hire quality employees who are testing positive for illicit drug use. Any economic or job gains by the industry must be measured by the jobs lost due to marijuana consumption. In fact, positive workplace marijuana tests have tripled since the year Colorado legalized recreational pot. Jim Johnson of the construction company GE Johnson, the CEO, said his company has encountered so many job candidates who have failed pre-employment drug tests because of their THC use that it is actively recruiting construction workers from other states. Let's talk about loss of transparency, loss of good government, loss of good medicine. The Denver Post has called for the Colorado Bureau of Investigation to launch an independent investigation into the number of marijuana state regulators who have left government to work for the marijuana industry. One regulator was indicted in a huge illegal marijuana fraud case. We have no press transparency. Three reporters, including reporters from the Denver Post, the Associated Press, and the Durango Herald have left major newspapers to work for the marijuana industry. When it comes to medicine, we're losing faith in our doctors. Mr. Corey himself represented four doctors who had their licenses suspended by the Colorado State Medical Board. The board claims that the four doctors provided excessive medical marijuana plants to more than 1,500 patients. Some included prescriptions for 75 plants per individual. The rec recommended amount is six. Irrelevant tax revenue. The tax revenue generated by marijuana is negligible. The costs far outweighed the revenues brought in. In fiscal year 2016, marijuana tax revenue resulted in $156 million. That sounds like a lot, but the total tax revenue for Colorado was $13 billion, making marijuana 1.18% of the total tax revenue. What about schools? Total 2016-17 marijuana revenue for Colorado Department of Education is $54.2 million. Wow, sounds like a lot. Not if your annual budget is $6.3 billion. That means marijuana revenue makes up about 0.86% of the total CDE budget. What about money going to classrooms? $40 million of marijuana tax revenue is spent on the state's public school capital construction assistance program. Again, $40 million sounds like a lot. That's what the industry touts. Well, when your statewide facility assessment determined a need for nearly $18 billion in capital construction pro projected through 2018, that means marijuana provides about 0.2% of the necessary capital for school construction projects. If you ask any teacher in Colorado, would they rather have less kids on pot or an additional 0.2% for school construction projects, every single teacher will tell you they'd rather have less kids on pot. Finally, expansion of big government. Marijuana is the number one reason why college students skip class. As they skip class, they skip work, who's going to take care of them? The truth is that the countries that expand access to illicit drugs also expand entitlement services right afterwards. While our society may be leaning libertarian on illicit drug regulations, they're not leaning that direction on social services. The result, Coloradans are paying the price for social services for the homeless and drug addicted with tax dollars while the marijuana industry makes hundreds of millions of dollars. We are left cleaning up the mess while drug dealers in suits are getting rich. Whether it's the safety of our children, our personal health, our communities, our roads, our businesses, loss of transparency and good government, all for irrelevant tax revenue and greater expansion of big government. Marijuana has devastated Colorado by every metric. If Colorado is a grand experiment in marijuana commercialization, it has failed miserably and should be rejected entirely by other states. Thanks. Thank you, Jeff. I want to start with something that I think both of you can agree on. The impact of pot legalization in Colorado is still not fully known. Part of that has to do with the drug itself. There's no consensus on what constitutes impairment. The Denver Post did an investigative series recently and found since legalization, pot is a factor in double the number of fatal crashes. In nearly 70% of those crashes, it's the only drug and most of those drivers tested positive for Delta 9 THC. So they would used within hours of the accident. Rob, I want to start with you. How do you argue that pot legalization has not made our roads less safe? Is it OK for people to use pot and then drive? It, it depends on the person. Marijuana affects everybody differently. It's not like alcohol. 
It's not a one size fits all. There are people out there walking the streets, living their lives, alleviating their pain, frankly, who have 30, 40, 50 nanograms of marijuana in their system at all times. It builds up. It has a positive effect, and it can be good for certain people. Doctors have established that. Individual doctors who see people and give them recommendations for medical marijuana, trained, licensed physicians in the state of Colorado who all hold DEA certifications. They're required to hold a DEA certification to make a recommendation. These doctors, meeting individually with the patient, have determined that marijuana is good for that patient. Oh, and by the way, the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment itself then certifies what that doctor says and issues a registry card to that person. So for some people, some people are required to drive with marijuana in their system. You know yourself. Think about it like any other medicine, all right? If you take OxyContin every day for the past year for some chronic pain system, you can drive on that because you're an adult, you're a responsible adult with a driver's license, and you can compensate for the effects of that medicine on you. If, on the other hand, you take OxyContin for the first time in your life, load up on three pills, and you're virtually knocked out, obviously don't drive. We live in a free country, a free country where grown adults make decisions to drive or not every day. Some adult makes a decision to drive while intoxicated on alcohol, and that causes a problem. Does that justify alcohol prohibition? Of course it doesn't. Nobody's seriously suggesting that. So people can and do drive while they are affected by marijuana. It's beneficial medical effects. And if it affects you too much, don't drive. It's that simple. Now, as for the study, I don't know how they come up with these studies of double the fatal crashes, marijuana's in their system. Marijuana's in your system for 30 days or longer. It, you, can, you can smoke it and stop smoking it and it could still be in your system 30 days later. So it's not alcohol it, and, it, and it isn't even monitored like alcohol. I've represented people in jury trials in marijuana cases. Some of them are convicted for two nanograms of marijuana in their system and others are acquitted for 20 nanograms of marijuana in their system. It's not a one size fits all. Juries see that. Juries of Coloradans <coughs> see that. Um, and I, but I would agree, we don't know fully all of the effects of ending 70 years of prohibition, um, which by the way, we haven't done that. And you'll hear, you heard a lot about legalization of marijuana, legalization this. It, unfortunately, it has not been legalized, unfortunately, in Colorado. Okay, thanks Rob. Jeff, according to that same post investigation, in nearly 40% of those fatal crashes, the driver had less than the five nanogram limit. Even the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration has called that limit artificial. People right. metabolize the drug differently. And they've questioned the value of testing because it doesn't necessarily tell whether a driver is high, as Rob referenced. Should we have a limit? What should it be? And do you agree that some people can drive safely under the influence of pot. Well, hearing the uh, Mr. Corey over here and hearing you talk about it, I, uh, frankly, I don't understand why we commercialized it at all. If we can't come up with a, a simple way to measure how much somebody can have and then drive, that's what I just heard. We have we have no way of measuring that. So why would we have not just decriminalized this but commercialized it? See, that's the big issue here, folks. We're not talking about not putting people in jail uh, because we, we think they might be smoking marijuana. We're talking about the mass commercialization of a brand new third drug in America. So if we don't know how to measure how much you can have and drive, why would we make a mass commercialization out of this? Okay. Do you mind if I, 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 I do, but I want to okay. follow up with a quick question to you because you had talked about pot remaining in people's system, which it does for months, weeks. But most of the drivers tested positive for Delta 9 THC, which means they've been using recently, not months ago. It depends if it's a blood test or, or if it's a urine test. The urine tests are... An, Sorry for getting too graphic, but that's, that's what it is. It's what it tests. Um, they're useless. 
utterly useless for detecting impairment or effect of marijuana. It stays in your system uh, 30 days. Blood tests can detect active versus inactive THC. And if that's what you're talking about, it's still, it, we, we don't have a uniform way of measuring driving impairment on any drug. Big pharma drugs, Oxycontin, you name it. There's no limit. There's no numerical limit. And law enforcement officers regularly charge people for driving under the influence of pharmaceutical drugs, and they do it the old-fashioned way. Common sense, police work, ob observation. And there's not a one-size-fits-all. So there's, I agree, this five nanogram thing is totally artificial, and juries see it as that and reject it regularly. Do you have any follow-up? No, I'm okay. <laughs> All right. Let's move to kids in pot. I have 15-year-old uh, twins, so this is of particular interest to me. Jeff, in less than a year, we've had several surveys, including the state health department, showing mm. the percent of kids 12 to 17 years old who use marijuana in the last month was either unchanged or even lower than it was before legalization. So even though Colorado teen use is still, as you've mentioned, among the highest in the country, right. legalization didn't change anything according to these surveys. Are all of these surveys wrong? Well, a few of them have methodological problems. So the biggest one is the Colorado Healthy Kids Survey, which uh, conveniently left out major counties and some of the largest counties. So you have Douglas County was left out of that, Jefferson County, Weld County, El Paso County. No measurement of how children are doing in those particular counties. So um, there are some methodological challenges. Some of the more uh, nationally based uh, reviews of youth use have found that either Colorado is number one or the most recent one, number two, only because Alaska has climbed up to number one now. Um, so they're not positions to be helpful in uh, or positions we want to be in. In fact, just earlier today, we heard from a school resource officer here in Douglas County who said that youth use uh, within the schools uh, has gone up 149% in Douglas County. Douglas County doesn't even allow for recreational marijuana shops to be uh, operational down there. So um, the fact that we're getting data that says that it's either uh, we've, we've remained number one or number two, that's not stuff to be proud of by any means, um, or from resource officers that are working directly with kids that are saying, um, from their st statisticians that we're up 149% with regards to youth use in Douglas County. Those are real serious problems. And I just read off a, a litany of reasons why this is damaging to young people. This is not something that Colorado should be proud of. If we want to talk about common areas with Mr. Corey, I sure hope that the marijuana industry will do everything it possibly can to keep marijuana out of the hands of kids. Rob, surveys aside, a children's hospital doctor looked at the number of teens showing up in the ER for pot-related issues. He found 106 in 2005, 631 in 2014. He called it significant. In light of that, how do you argue that pot legalization hasn't hurt Colorado kids? Well, the federal government tells us that adolescent marijuana use is at a 14-year low right now, and this is this is a few years into post-Amendment 64. Marijuana use among children 12 to 17 decreased 6.5%, the lowest since 2002. Um, so, and these are national trends, these are studies, but you know, sometimes folks, common sense, we don't have a lot of statisticians as elected representatives of Congress, we don't have a lot of statisticians as elected representatives in our state legislature, our city councils and our governments, tend not to be elected statisticians. Nothing against statisticians. They are great people. But sometimes you've got to use your common sense. How do we know that a given 12-year-old has used or hasn't used marijuana? Honestly, think about that. How, do we, how, do we, how are these surveys conducted? Do we call them, hey, 12-year-old, random 12-year-old that you've never seen me before, will you admit over the phone that you use <laughs> marijuana? I mean, think about it. The, the studies are bogus, ladies and gentlemen, and we can't base public policy on these fake statistics. We have to make, base public policy on common sense and our principles. And our principles as Americans and as a free country are that 
government should be small and limited and parents need to parent and government needs to get out of the parenting business. What? <laughs> I wouldn't, would, would you agree that you know, common sense would dictate if a kid finds something less risky that they would be more likely to do it? Not necessarily. Kids have a harder time acquiring marijuana now. They're in schools. <laughs> All right, let's go on my personal. I live in Boulder. I would take issue with that. So, so before Amendment 64, before Amendment 64, you're, you're telling me, that schools were devoid of marijuana. We, we had no marijuana in Colorado schools before the voters, a majority, a, a strong majority of voters decided to amend a con our constitution. I grew up in the 1980s during the, in high school, during the depths of extreme prohibition. And I had about 12 to 16 individual sources of marijuana at my fingertips every single day of high school. I knew where their lockers were, we had an efficient market, and, it was, and it, the price point was set. But you know what? Zero taxes were paid, zero regulation. You talked about 27% uh, of the money is still spent in the black market. And by the way, we don't, I don't buy this term black market. If it's legalized, there, there can't be a, and what's the opposite of a black market? A white market? Is, what, what, can we get away from these loaded terms, black market, white market, th that kind of thing? If it's legalized, which it isn't, there is no black market for it, all right? And by the way, the voters of our state placed in our Constitution an individual right to marijuana for every 21-year-old. Yes, all of you who are 21 or older, every single one of you has a right to grow six plants. That can't be taken away. That is locked into our Constitution. The legislature can't touch that. That's our voters. Our voters said that and enacted that. Okay, I wanna give Jeff a chance okay. to jump in here. Yeah, two things real quick. One is that we've seen a record acceptance by young people that marijuana is not a harmful drug. Um, so this is increasing. This is part of the effort by the marijuana industry to lower inhibition towards this drug so that people can become a lifetime users. But here's the greatest indicator of where the marijuana industry is when it comes to youth use, how much they care about whether or not our kids are using marijuana. It took them three and a half years to finally say, you know what, we're not gonna make marijuana gummy bears. We're not gonna make children's candy that looks like marijuana. If you really care about youth use, you should have never created that in the very first place. Okay, that tells you exactly where the industry is on this. All right, they are laser focused on creating an entire new generation of users so they can make millions, hundreds of millions of dollars while the rest of us have to spend tax, day, tax dollars cleaning up uh, all the challenges that these are gonna create for our communities. Thank you. I, I real quick answer this, because you said you have five kids. What do you tell your kids about marijuana? I tell them that marijuana is, first of all, for sick people. If, if, if you're a kid, and there are kids, and they know these kids, they've met these kids that benefit from marijuana. And there is no question that these children benefit from marijuana. The laws of our state, in order for a person under 18 to get access to medical marijuana, require not one but two physicians, licensed <laughs> medical physicians. Obviously, it requires the consent of one parent. I know these parents. And these parents have nothing but love for their children, and their children benefit from medical marijuana. And, and there are hundreds of children in Colorado legally using medical marijuana today, right now, with the full approval of our State Department of Health, and they are benefiting from it. Their seizures are, are stopping, and these parents literally weep for the good effect that medical marijuana has. So I tell them about those kids. They meet those kids. They, my kids know those kids and they have sympathy for those kids. And then I tell them, you're not drinking alcohol until you're 21. You're not doing that, and if I catch you doing it, there will be consequences. I, my uh, system of government is not a democracy, it's a benevolent dictatorship. There's no court system and no legislative branch, there's a single executive, and there will be severe consequences when those kids are caught with alcohol, and one of them will be caught in the next few years, I am sure. The oldest is 12, the youngest is 10 months. It's a reality. They live in the world. And the same with pot. 
And, and, it, and if they're caught with that, it's the same thing, unless there's a medical thing. And there's, there's a medical aspect to marijuana that is completely glossed over uh, in all of these debates. And that existed 12 years before uh, Amendment 64. I, I'm going to get to that. All right. I want to move on, though. Um, you had mentioned the black market. And by black market, I want to, when I say black market, what I'm talking about is um, unlicensed dealers, unregistered, right, in Colorado. So when voters legalized pot, many were sold on the notion that it would help reduce the black market. But in just the past few months, and Jeff, I think you touched on this, law enforcement has discovered several huge illegal grows where they were selling pot out of state. In one case, they found 2,500 plants, 4,000 pounds of pot. Rob, legalization does not seem to have reduced that black market. If anything, law enforcement will say it's attracted the cartels. What do we need to do better? Well, you just said that now 27% is, spent, is spent in what you call the black market. I said that? Or I, maybe it was Jeff. <laughs> I, guess. I was coming <laughs> from over there. Um, I, I don't, I'm not sure where he gets those statistics because I got the, that from the westward. black market, <laughs> the so-called black market doesn't file any tax returns and doesn't report their earnings. So why, how do we come up with these precise numbers like 27%? But of course there is a... I guess we could call it a gray market since marijuana has been legalized. Mm -hmm. There can't be a black market. Okay. So we'll, let's call it a gray market. And there is this individual right in Colorado. Every single adult gets six plants. That is constitutional law. That can't be changed. That can't be changed. That's, that's no gray market. That's legal, perfectly legal, your individual rights. Now, if marijuana is $1,000 a pound wholesale in our state, give or take, it, it hovers, and it's $5,000 a pound wholesale in Kansas, where is it going to go? Of course, some of it is going to leave our state. You might as well try to pass a law that prevents the wind from blowing across Colorado's border into Kansas. It is basic economics, folks, basic economics. Anyone been to Wyoming lately, by the way? Have you driven up I-25? Have you seen the giantest fireworks store in the world six inches over the Col Colorado Wyoming border. Do you think that giant fireworks store, biggest in the world, serves the population of Wyoming with fireworks, the 500,000 people that live in the state, in the great state of Wyoming, and it just happens to be six inches over our border? Of course it doesn't. Those fireworks are all going into Colorado, and it's because Colorado has stupid laws that ban fireworks and ban people from setting them off on the 4th of July, and Wyoming has better laws. Now, do you hear Colorado weeping and crying to Wyoming? Ooh, protect us from your illegal fireworks. Please protect us. And actually, fireworks are more harmful than pot. They, they burn down trees. They, they can create um, forest fires and that sort of thing. So that law has you know, a smidgen of, of rationality to it. Um, but it's just the, the, the suspension of common sense. When it, marijuana, it is true. Marijuana drives some people crazy but not the people that consume it. The, the people that are trying to prevent others from consuming it. It drives, marijuana drives other, I have talked to otherwise intelligent, high level drug investigators, police officers, prosecutors. I mean, some of these people just can't handle the idea of somebody in his, on his front porch, smoking a joint and just relaxing. It, these, these <laughs> basics. Okay. basic economic principles of if it's legal in one place and or decriminalized or regulated in one place and completely illegal in another place, of course it's going there. And by the way, it's not our problem. That is Nebraska's problem and that is Kansas's problem. If they want laws that go back 80 years that are totally failed laws, that is those states' problem, not our problem. Thank you. So, Jeff, I know you want to respond to some of what he said, but um, I also want to ask you, the state just passed a law limiting home grows to right. 12 plants. Yep. And it does a very, it has a very robust regulatory structure that gets more so every year. I covered the state capitol. There's always pot regulation bills there. Short of outlawing pot, what regulation do you think would reduce that gray market? What has the state not done? Well, the biggest challenge to this development of a gray market or black market is that, um, and we just heard it from a bunch of law enforcement officers that were up here just uh, an hour ago, um, is that you have cartels that are operating under the shadows of this quote-unquote legality. 
Um, I don't know if anything that we've passed so far is going to help with that. Pueblo was talking about the fact that they don't have the resources. They could go out every single day and shut down um, illegal grows down in Pueblo, and they're all operating under the guise of, of legal operations. So um, the cartels, whether they're uh, from within this country or outside this country, have recognized that they can grow marijuana here and ship it out um, to other states, and it's created a, a major problem. So um, I'm not sure what we could possibly regulate that's going to help reduce that. It, it seems like uh, most law enforcement are just um, at a loss right now to what to do to try to reduce um, the black market development that's taking place here. Um, to Mr. Corey's point that, uh, that the only people that are crazy with regards to marijuana are the people that want to uh, reduce its effects here in Colorado, I do want to point out uh, just some of the deaths that have taken place here in Colorado. Daniel Juarez, an 18-year-old from Brighton, stabbed himself 20 times uh, with a THC level uh, of 38.2 nanograms in Colorado. Um, that is, five nanograms is considered impaired driving. He had 38.2, he took, he stabbed himself 20 times. Richard Kirk of Denver took an edible, put a gun to his wife's head and pulled the trigger while his three boys were in, in the house. Uh, Levi uh, Pongi, a 19-year-old college student, jumped from a Denver balcony to his death in 2014 after eating marijuana edibles. College student Luke Goodman killed himself in Keystone in March shortly after ingesting marijuana edibles. His mother told CBS4 she believed that marijuana has caused the death of her child. An autopsy showed that, that he did have THC in his body. Um, in addition to that, the 115 people that have died in car accidents related to uh, having marijuana in their systems. Uh, this is, continues to devastate our state. Here's the challenge the marijuana industry had. For years, it was all promises. And now, their policies are being played out. And they stink. They're terrible for Colorado. And they have no defense for it. That is what we are holding them accountable to today. Can Rob, I, I know you want to quick, can, can we keep point. it about a minute or less so we yeah, can I'll get keep, to some I'll of these other topics? very brief. Right? Okay. And I just want to say, all right, we've heard marijuana is good, marijuana is bad. I would like to hear some from, from Mr. Hunt, some specific policy prescription. What, what, should, what should the government do specifically? Because I, I think we need to get to that where it's, it's approaching four o'clock here. Um, I mean, is prison or jail, should, is that the specific policy prescription? Prison or jail for those who produce it? Or just some specific, because you can attack our industry all day long. We're not perfect. We never claim to be perfect. Um, right. but you know, what, what is the specific policy that, that should be enacted? Prohibition? Okay. I, I am more than happy. I am more than happy to have a conversation any day of the week on how we can decriminalize marijuana so that people that are uh, smoking it or that are addicted to it can get the health care they need to get off of it. I'm even happy to explore the Portugal model, okay? But look at these models, whether it's Amsterdam or Portugal, it's still illegal. What you have in and what's happening in Colorado with the marijuana industry is not a conversation about decriminalization. It's about commercialization. And I'm mad. I'm mad as hell is what they're doing to Colorado because they are about selling Colorado out to make money. And if we want to have a conversation, a specific policy conversation as to how we can uh, reduce uh, criminal incarcerations, how we can reduce recidivism, happy to do all that. But this is not a conversation about decriminalization. I wish it was. And I think most people, when they voted for Amendment 64, thought that this was about decriminalization. They don't want to send people that might have a joint uh, to prison. We, I don't want the federal government kicking down the door with automatic rifles and dragging somebody away just because they have a joint in their, in their pocket. That wasn't even happening. That's a total exaggeration. Um, what is happening right now is a whole new industry that's recognizing that if they can get people hooked on a drug exact same way that Big Tobacco did, if they can get them hooked, they have lifetime users, they're gonna make a fortune, and the rest of us are gonna be cleaning up their mess. All right, I wanna move on. For better or worse, we have a thriving cannabis tourism industry in Colorado, but people come here, they buy pot, and because the law bars the open and public consumption, they have nowhere to use it. 
I want to start with you, Jeff. Yep. Would cannabis clubs, wouldn't cannabis clubs, tasting rooms, <coughs> pot delivery, things that the legislature is all considered, help make things safer by keeping people from using pot in public and then maybe driving? Um, I don't think so. I mean, I, frankly, I don't really care about um, cannabis tourists that want to come here and smoke marijuana. I, and I don't think we need to provide anything for them. I don't like the fact they're here smoking marijuana to begin with. But it's about safety. Do you want them? No. Smoking in public? No, I don't want driving. them smoking in public. In fact, if we could get the message across to, in fact, we've got a lot of cameras here. Um, if you're coming to Colorado to smoke marijuana, don't, we don't like you. We don't want you coming to Colorado to smoke marijuana. Well, actually, so, you know, I'm, I'm a taxpayer in the state, and I run a business in this state, and I, and I pay mortgages in this state, and I, I want people to come to our state and spend money and create economic activity and jobs. That's an example of the insanity. He is literally telling people, don't come to our state, don't spend money in our state, don't create jobs in our state. That's what tourism does. Tourism is Colorado's number one industry, folks. And he is telling people not to come to our state. Unbelievable, ladies and gentlemen, unbelievable how insane people become when they think about marijuana. Okay, I want to get back to the question of the pot clubs. Aren't, aren't people skirting the law, Rob, that open and public part of the law by setting up those clubs or those social consumption businesses for anyone in the public? Can, over 21 can come in. Do you really think this is what voters had in mind when they passed Amendment 64? And isn't this a bit of a slippery slope? No. That once you open a pot club, you know, and you have people bring it themselves, then they're going to say, well, then you can buy it there, and then alcohol is going to come in. And we, we did not mislead voters. We titled, we titled our amendment the Regulate Marijuana Like Alcohol Act of 2012. That was the title of our amendment. That was the entire campaign following the Reverend Pat Robertson. Should we treat marijuana like alcohol or should we not? All right, that was our campaign. That was what the campaign was about and what little opposition there was, was don't treat it like alcohol. Keep throwing people in prison for it. Most of our opposition at the time were cops and the basic prohibition industrial complex, the thousands of people that get their paychecks every day from locking people up by using marijuana. That was our opposition then. Oh, they don't exist? All right, fine. Now. Here, here is, here, do we want to treat it like alcohol or not? All right. We have in Colorado tens of thousands of taverns, bars, and saloons. Those are places where people go and consume alcohol in groups. They're allowed to do that. It's licensed. It's, it's a normal thing. Imagine if we shut down every single tavern, bar, and saloon in the state of Colorado. Imagine. Are people going to just stop drinking? Oh, I, I think I'll just stop because I don't have a place to go. No. There's a party coming to your neighborhood, next to your house, every day. That's where people are going to drink alcohol. They're going to drink it on the streets. If you eliminate all taverns, bars, and saloons, well, that's what Colorado's done with marijuana. We don't have legal, regulated places to consume marijuana. It, it, it's not part of the all-knowing state's top-to-bottom regulatory scheme. Unbelievable, isn't it? Unbelievable that the state bureaucrats are so ignorant about human nature, basic human nature. We have okay. thousands of places where you can purchase marijuana in our state, and the only place where you can legally smoke it and consume it is your own home, okay. and many people can't do it there. All right, Woo! Jeff, did you have yeah. real quick? Sure, a quick response to this. So, uh, you know, alcohol consumption, tobacco consumption, they're at a rate much higher than marijuana consumption, right? And it's because the reason marijuana consumption and most illicit drug consumption is a fraction of what alcohol and tobacco consumption is, is because we make it illegal. We prohibit it. We don't want people smoking marijuana, and as a result, it's uh, less people do. Um, one of my favorite responses to this is the idea that alcohol is worse than tobacco, or alcohol and tobacco are worse than marijuana. Um, if that's the case, you're granting that, that that public drugs are, are a serious problem. You're saying that alcohol and tobacco are, are a serious problem. So why in the world would you add a third drug to that mix? Why are we gonna add a third one? If these are already problematic, 
Why would we add a third one to Because it? prohibition of any of them is worse than the drug itself. No, it's not. Prohibition of alcohol was far more harmful than alcohol itself. Can you imagine if we prohi legally prohibited cigarettes? And to, can you imagine the carnage and the organized crime that would instantly spring up and supply millions of people with cigarettes? Can you imagine? Are you seriously okay. suggesting that we legally I prohibit alcohol and cigarettes? Are, are you? I can't imagine you're suggesting that. Raise your hand you if alcohol to? prohibition was a good, sound, useful, successful public policy. Raise your hand if you think that. One person. One, I, I, I rarely get anybody. All right. Three. All right. But I'm asking okay. the alcohol questions. Alcohol prohibition. Al alcohol prohibition? All right. I, I mean, I appreciate your honesty. I Jeff, really did do. did you have but... something real quick to Well, I'm jump still going to go back to the okay. fact that the reason why marijuana use is so far less than alcohol and tobacco use is because we've kept it illegal. I don't understand why. This goes back to, the, to my, my primary thesis here. Um, we, most of us in this room, whether you're Republican, Democrat, Libertarian, um, conservative, believe that we don't want people on drugs in our society. We don't want people on drugs. We think it's, it's a worse society when people are on drugs, except for the marijuana industry. They want more people on drugs. That's why they're pushing for this to be legal so they can get more and more people hooked on this drug and it's gonna harm our communities. All right, I wanna, it is. so I wanna talk about legalization nationwide now. One of the arguments for it is racial justice. And yet the majority of pot businesses, especially in Denver, are in low income neighborhoods with a lot of minorities. And arrests of Latino and African American kids are up while those for white kids are down. Rob has, Okay. Rob, hasn't pot legalization hurt minorities? And is Denver's ordinance that the new one that says any grows have to be a thousand feet from any residential area, is that fair? The marijuana industry, which I am proud to represent, is one of the most diverse racially and gender industries that exists. We are a brand new industry. We don't judge people based on the color of their skin. We judge people based on the content of their character. This industry has brought jobs and economic benefit to communities that need it most. So I'm proud of what we've created. Are we perfect? Of course we're not perfect. Of course we could have more diverse ownership of, of these uh, entities, but we have that already. And, we, and we're, we are getting better, and we are a young industry, too. Okay. We are a very young industry. There's Jeff, a lot of young one entrepreneurs. Of, one of the reasons drug traffickers come to Colorado, which you touched on, is because they can hide illegal activity easier. Wouldn't legalizing recreational pot nationwide bring down the price and help dry up that black gray market? I don't think so, and I want to respond to Mr. Corey. The one thing that your industry has definitely done, according to uh, studies here, is put more African-American and Hispanic youth into prison. Um, Our we've industry had, in prisons. We, we've well, I, had, I did not know that we had. We've that had level an of power. increase. We've had an increase of arrests of Hispanic youth by 29 percent. We've had an increase of arrests by African American youth by 58 percent. That's what you don't understand. We are flooding our communities with drugs. They're trickling down to youth, and it's ruining the future of African American and Hispanic youth. That's what your industry has done. Okay. Wait, no, 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 wait, I want to open it up real quick because we're running out of time to any questions from the audience. Do we have any? Did you write them down? No? All right. Yeah, I, I'm a former law enforcement can, officer. Can you stand up, please? Yeah, Thank you. I'm a former law enforcement officer here in the, the Denver metro area. And I can say anecdotally speaking, I saw the devastation that alcohol certainly causes, particularly in, in terms of domestic violence, uh, auto accidents. I also saw the devastation caused by marijuana in terms of auto accidents, in terms of, 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 of other things. Um, my question to you is, there, there, demonstrably, we can see now, the statistics are already showing in a short period of time, that opening the floodgates of legalization has resulted in a tsunami in, in terms of an increase in uh, traffic-related accidents. Uh, uh, Stemming from marijuana use, you you said something that really struck me. You uh, and, and I think there's an analogy here. I have heard all of the same. I want to say rationalizations 
from proponents of alcohol on drunk driving. He said, well, marijuana affects everybody differently. So does alcohol. Yeah. People can, there are people who can drink as a police officer. <laughs> I saw people who can, were a can, point three. Can we just, can we get to the yeah, question? I'm sorry. Thank you. That were able to compensate. Walk. I saw people that were a point two BAC that could pass a roadside test. So in order to be intellectually consistent, I assume that you are also calling for the removal of all uh, arbitrary 0 0.05, 0 0.08, or 0 0.8, 0 0.08 uh, in, in terms of BAC for alcohol, because to, to remain intellectually consistent, you would have to. Is, so should we get rid that, of the limits for of course, alcohol? It, th those limits are ridiculous. For it alcohol be, and for pot. The old-fashioned way our country illegalized drunk driving for decades based on officers in the field making their judgments. We trusted the police back then. We didn't need these uh, arbitrary standards. There are some people who can't handle one drink. Those people shouldn't be driving. Those grown adults need to make the right decision for themselves. And then there are some people who probably can hold their liquor really well and drive with a .12. It ought to go back to the old fashioned way it was. If, if you're like it is for every other substance and every other medicine, okay. let me ask we, you this. We officer. don't have we let don't me ask have the you roadside this. sobriety tests for oh, pot we do. like we do. we do for alcohol. Oh well, no, they're experimenting I, with them right now. I have now, but litigated we don't have them. 20 of these marijuana DUI cases. Officers are trained to spot marijuana impairment, and they do, and they, they can identify it. And the guilty people, I will say, more often than not, do get convicted, and the innocent people, more often than not get acquitted the system not every time but it works most of the time but let me ask this you know officer how many calls during your career and I, I don't know I'm assuming you were a, a street officer on patrol you know did you get a lot of domestic violence calls guy beating up his girlfriend or wife beating up his kids when marijuana was a factor no I'll tell you where all of the problems came from okay, was let, alcohol let's let, let him answer real quickly yeah. um, yes I did okay. see oh well, you're the first cop I've ever, ever heard that I'm from. Saying, I'm not saying that marijuana was exclusively at play, because marijuana comes with that, or the use of other illicit drugs, alcohol abuse, other pathologies. We know this to be the case. But what, what I will say is the hyperbole I've heard from you today in terms of cops kicking down the doors and take, throwing people in prison because they have one joint. When I was a police officer, if we pulled somebody over, they were not in clearly where we're not impaired, or, or if we were in another setting where we found marijuana paraphernalia, a joint under an ounce, we didn't call them off to jail. This, this a boogeyman, this specter of police officers going after people who are using in small amounts marijuana for recreational use. What, what we targeted were people who were carrying large amounts uh, with an intent to, carrying with an intent to distribute. That's what every cop I've ever known is focused on, not okay. this specter of the individual who's suffering a brain tumor and is smoking a joint and is going to get called off to marijuana. So okay. The, the and, and where does Wait, wait, we got to move on because we're running out of time. So we had another question from the audience. I know I saw her first. Can we let her and then you... I did nine years of residency and I'm board certified in family practice, pediatrics, and emergency medicine. And I spent 18 years teaching at an academic facility. And so when I look at the research, and I'm actually doing research now, and you talk about all the studies that have been done, I'm missing those. So I'm inviting you, one, to come work a shift with me. Come work with me, see what I see. Come out and do the homeless outreach that I do, that you don't do, I'm gonna guess. So come with me to do homeless outreach. It's a public invitation. Take me up on this. Come work a shift with me. Okay. Come spend the night shift with we, me. You think we that's have. It. You, you guys can talk after it's done. And we have another question, uh, actually, right over here. I'm sorry. She. Uh, uh, Making Jordan run. <laughs> Shauna Jance and I attend CCU here and um, I come from a position just where I have seen um, the beneficial effects of marijuana within my own family. I have uh, close relatives who partake in uh, CBD strictly and I would never um, want that happiness that I believe um, CBD has allowed in their life to 
um, you know, be uh, mistaken. And I also have friends who participate in the recreational use of marijuana as well. And so this question comes from just a, a young 22-year-old girl trying to responsibly understand how to um, gauge this marijuana issue. And the first question I just kind of wondered and um, wanted to just pose out there is the responsibility of the industry as in dispensaries to um, properly label the THC amount and dosing. Um, one, because on the side of medical marijuana, I know um, a close friend of mine who struggled um, you know, exacting dosage and um, really finding like an, uh, I guess, an exact and appropriate and right amount of like what was THC versus not so THC. There so have I been some new uh, regulations around that. Yeah, and Is I just wanted to Do you want to talk about that, Rob, briefly? Sure. And it's a great question and an excellent point. First of all, the distinction between CBD, which is hemp, so it can be produced without any THC in it. So it's not even legally defined as, as marijuana, but it is cannabis and it's the same species, cannabis sativa, and the plant looks very similar, almost identical to the naked eye. Um, and that's, that was the original intent of prohibition was to eliminate that beneficial plant that does have benefits and, and they're totally different benefits. But she was asking about the dosage right. uh, requirements and, and in terms of writing them on the packaging. We, we are the most regulated industry as far as our packaging. And you folks should go visit a dispensary and buy some and check it out. You really should before you, before you hate us. Uh, you know, you should learn before you hate. Um, the, the dosing is so precise. It, it, it's required to be labeled. And keep this in mind too though. You know, we, we were fully illegal as a, as a recreational industry until 2012, and we're still, there's still a lot of illegality. We haven't legalized marijuana um, in Colorado, unfortunately. But how do you develop better products, more, more safe, more effective, better labeling, dosing, study these things? I mean, Hillary Clinton says we can't legalize it until we study it. Well, you can't study it until it's legalized. Sorry, Hillary. And there um, have been efforts at the federal level to do more studies. Israel is a leading, uh, uh, America is not the entire world. There are other countries that are far ahead of us in studying cannabis. And there are thousands of studies out there, thousands of them. Okay. Um, and we label, and, and you, you know, we did struggle 70 years of prohibition. The substance is illegal. It's not, you know, nicely labeled and, and packaged for folks. We're coming out of that. Um, the, the consequences of, you know, 70 years of criminal prohibition of marijuana, which still continue to this day, um, we're coming out of that, and we're coming okay. out of that, and I'm proud of how we we're coming out We have one last question. Hello, my name is Filippo Guarino, young entrepreneur in the cannabis industry. Anyways, I've received two shoulder surgeries this year, and uh, I was prescribed 30 milligram Oxycontin. Yep. Just this year. I'm 20 years old, big pain tolerance, took a lot for these pills to have to Tech come in effect. It got to the point where these pills were affecting me so much to where I was having to lay in bed all day. I quit my job. I was too lazy for anything. I was too groggy all the time. I was, you could just tell, tell a difference mm -hmm. in my demeanor and attitude on a daily basis. So my question is to you, with someone like me, where cannabis has totally cut Oxycontin out of my life when it's very, I still need to be taken it to this day technically. Mm -hmm. My doctor, I can still go get a prescription. I haven't touched it since January. I had, uh, uh, January 11th was my surgery. Took it for the first week after that. I was prescribed the medical marijuana, and since my life has been absolutely changed. So, what would you say to the people like me who right. absolutely benefit? And I don't want to take thirty. I don't know if you guys have taken a thirty milligram oxycon before, but that's quite a that's quite a drug. I'm 20 years old, okay. and that's prescribed to me by by a regular so, practitioner. Yeah. So, what do so you say for the people like me who actually really do benefit from it and cannot go to these silly pills that they be prescribing yeah. just because I have the health insurance because they're going to get money from my insurance? Why? Like, what, what do you suggest for people like me who are okay. in need of help? Yeah. And, and that touches great, on great the medical question. Excuse me? Pop. Yep, oh. yep touches. Therapy. Absolutely. So, I did physical uh, therapy, and okay. I had to get another surgery afterwards. So what, okay. what would, if, uh, are you presenting? Okay, let, yeah. oh, we okay. can address I'll that I'll come to you for my shoulder problems Let's next Let's let time Jeff then. answer the question. Thank you. 
So um, first of all, I do want to say this. I want to thank Rob, Corey, and I want to thank, if you're in the cannabis industry, I want to thank you for coming here to CCU. I know it could be a little intimidating, but the fact that you guys came <laughs> means a lot to us. So first of all, I want to thank you for coming. So, um, and I want to be uh, intellectually honest too. So in my research, uh, I found a National Inth Institute of Health study that looked at 76 studies involving about 6,000 people. So they, they, they surveyed uh, a number of other kind of broad studies. And they did find moderate quality evidence to support the use of cannabinoids in the treatment of chronic pain uh, and spasticity. Um, but they did find some other stuff that said that there was low quality evidence that said it could be used for, for other things. Um, we heard from Kevin Sabet today, Dr. Sabet, who's part of uh, SAM, Smart Approaches to Marijuana. I think every conservative and every opponent to marijuana has no problem if the research and FDA research leads to the use of some aspects of marijuana to be used for pain relief. Um, I don't think we have any problems with that, but it's got to be done the proper way. We want to see the FDA lead on that. So far, um, just last year, the FDA did a big study and didn't find much for marijuana. That's why they left it as a Schedule One drug under the Obama administration. Um, you know, conservatives have also been leading the way with the Orrin Hatch bill, I, th I think I saw it come out of the U.S. Senate or introduced to the U.S. Senate, to look at, at more research. Um, we don't mind research. We're, we want to be intellectually honest. If there are aspects of marijuana that, that uh, can be professionalized under the FDA um, properly uh, so that uh, they can be used in those cases, we have no problem with that. What we do have a problem with is the fact that we've created an entire drug that circumvented the FDA and is now being uh, promoted uh, publicly as if it's part of alcohol or tobacco f in hopes of getting people hooked to that. That's a real problem for us. So. All, right. All right. We're going to wrap up the questions here because we've got to get to closing arguments. I know you went first for the opening. Do you want to go sure. first for the close, Jeff? Sure, absolutely. Um, again, thank you all so much for coming out. This has been a, a great discussion all day, and I hope we can continue to do this. I think at the end of the day, what we all want is a great Colorado. Um, we want to find public policy solutions that make Colorado wonderful. Our contention is that the commercialization of marijuana has, has deeply harmed Colorado and needs to be rolled back, and every state in the nation should take a look at, at what this was a grand experiment. It's a failed experiment. The marijuana industry for years offered a, tr a lot of promises. And for the last four years, three and a half, four years, have got to live out those public policy ideas. And they failed. They failed by every single metric that I mentioned here earlier. Um, pull it up here. Uh, from the safety of our children, personal health, loss of transparency and good government, uh, irrelevant tax revenue, safety of our communities, the safety of our roads, the harm to social services, the harm to businesses, the expansion of big government. This has been an abject failure um, by every single metric. So it needs to be rolled back and every state needs to take notice of this. A few things I wanted to close in on here. Uh, there's, a, there's a notion uh, here that f for whatever reason we're against liberty, that we're against freedom. Uh, conservatives have always argued that freedom is not an end unto itself. Freedom must be matched by justice and by order. Edmund Burke discussed that. Russell Kirk discussed that. He wrote that most of the founding fathers, having read John Milton, were well aware of the dangerous persons who license they mean when they cry liberty. So our friends here, my friend Rob Corey here, cries liberty, but what he really means is license. A few of the American patriots like Samuel Adams, most of his career, or Patrick Henry early in his life stood for an absolute and all-embracing liberty of every man to do as his impulse bade him, but a great majority. Led by prudent men like John Adams, Benjamin Franklin, James Madison, Governor Morris, George Wythe, John Rutledge, James Wilson, John Marshall, Alexander Hamilton, and others, men of every party and faction desired only a disciplined, traditional, moderate, law-respecting freedom. As Edmund Burke said, the founder of conservatism, their passions forged their fetters. And I think that's what's happened here in Colorado. Our passion for marijuana has forged a restraints upon our society that are not good. We've harmed our society. American freedom 
has been the liberty of temperate policies and temperate intellects. So um, that's what I think conservatives are asking for. We're not asking for big government. We're asking for liberty to be matched by order and justice, uh, by natural law, that freedom would line up with uh, what we could do as great citizens. That's what freedom was designed for, to make it a good society. I've often said that um, we can claim the freedom mantle all the way from, uh, from Bedford Falls to Pottersville. If you remember that movie, It's a Wonderful Life. Uh, that, uh, yeah, Pottersville had more freedom. They were drinking in the streets. They were fighting in the streets. It wasn't a better community. And uh, I think what we're all, all seeking here is, is Bedford Falls. I do want to uh, also address, I see this a lot on the internet, Genesis 129. Uh, that the sixth day of creation, somehow God gave us the freedom to be able to go and uh, eat marijuana. Um, <laughs> two problems uh, with this. One is it's, it's a bad exegesis. Uh, the chapter is about dominion. So if you look right after that verse, it's God gives us the beasts of the, of the ground and the birds of the air and everything that crawls. So what he's calling us to is good dominion and good stewardship. Um, if God gave us every plant to eat, we'd have a problem with hemlock and castor seed and deadly nightshade and there's seven other deadly plants that you could eat that would kill you, which I don't think God wants us to do. So I'm gonna close here on this notion of stewardship. Um, going back to that verse, uh, we are called to be good stewards, um, to help create a society that's gonna allow children to thrive, to grow up in a great state where uh, they can be all that they can possibly be. Uh, what we've seen with marijuana is uh, a devolution of this state as our kids are hooked on a drug driven by an industry that seeks to make a tremendous amount of profit off of them. So we need to roll back marijuana. Uh, we need to uh, tell other states about what's happening. And in doing so, I think we can make uh, a far better and greater Colorado. Thanks. Great. And thank you, Rob. Thank you again for moderating a tough job, but you handled it very well. And thank <laughs> you, Jeff bad. Hunt, for having this debate. Thank you for being willing to debate at all. You know, I will say, it, in, in doing this and, and arguing for uh, removing prison as a possible consequence for either medical marijuana or just marijuana um, over the years, you know, the other side rarely agreed to debate. That's why we won. They had nothing. They had zero. And like I said, our entire opposition used to be basically the prohibition industrial complex. The drug treatment people, the prohibition office, pro, uh, probation officers, um, police officers, DEA agents, prosecutors who get, their, who get their paycheck every week from marijuana being illegal. That was our opposition back then. They had nothing. Uh, we heard a little bit of policy prescriptions from the other side, uh, rolling it back. I guess that means bringing back or enhancing sentences for people, prison sentences, using prison as a tool. There is nothing, there is no bigger government than the government that has the power and the authority to take marijuana away from you. And, and, and this is not about just taking marijuana out of somebody's hands. There, there's never a marijuana pusher. Every single buyer of cannabis is a willing buyer. Every single seller is, whether it's the so-called black market or gray market or white market, there's no pushing of it. Um, prohibition has been a complete failure. It was a total failure for alcohol. Nearly everybody agrees with that. Nobody wants to, to move that back. Alcohol is a harmful substance, but it's a harmful substance for some people, but the vast majority of intelligent adults who can control themselves, can use alcohol responsibly, that's why prohibition utterly failed. And that's, that's the major distinction. This, I don't think this debate is ever going to be settled on, is marijuana a good thing? I happen to believe it is a good thing, and it's a beneficial thing. And it is a good thing for people, undisputedly medically, you could meet these people that I know. You could see them. We, we've been through jury trials, days and days of jury trials, excruciating testimony. I mean, there is no doubt that marijuana has medical benefits. Let's talk about the slightly more controversial 
thing of recreational wellness benefits, it can cause you to think differently. It can open your creativity. It can be a positive thing. It can be a positive thing. And frankly, it can be a positive thing even for religious faith. It can be a spiritual experience, all right? It can bring you closer to God. You know it, and I know it. And if you're afraid of it, and, and you know what? It's not for everybody. It's not for everybody. Some people are afraid of their own minds, and if that's the case, maybe it's not for you. But don't try to stop others who want it. That, that's America. That's, that's the failure of prohibition. The utter failure of prohibition. As Abraham Lincoln said, prohibition goes beyond the bounds of reason and that it attempts to control a man's appetite by legislation and makes a crime out of things that are not crimes. A prohibition law strikes a blow at the very principles upon which our government were founded. Marijuana prohibition is completely alien to every single one of the great founders that Jeff just answered. Oh, okay, let, let's let him just finish, okay? All right, it, it's not for everybody, all right? It's, marijuana is not for everybody. Some people can't handle it, but some people can and let those people do it in a free country, in a free country. Now, freedom offends people. The, the idea of freedom, you hear that on the lips of just about every politician who comes at this from the right side. The word freedom crosses their lips like empty rhetoric, like almost like uh, you know, saying some rote thing that they've memorized. But when they actually see freedom, when they see commerce, and what's wrong with commercialization, by the way, in a free capitalist country that thrives on free market? What, what is wrong with commercialization? And then, then Big Pharma is the hero? You want to talk about commercialization? Unbelievable. Unbelievable. The trillions of dollars that is in the big pharma global cartel. They're the good guys because they have an FDA head that was a CEO of big pharma yesterday who's now, had, they're the good guys. And we're the bad guys growing an organic plant placed on this earth by God. I'm sorry I get a little passionate about these things. It's been a long battle. Apparently, the battle's not over. But we in Colorado, the battle is over in Colorado, I'm sorry to say. You don't eliminate a $3 billion industry. We're here to stay. Sorry. Sorry. We're, we're here. We're, we're, we, are locked in, we are locked into our constitution, which the oil industry just amended to make it so you can't amend it now. So we're locked into the constitution here. All right. Sorry. Thank you. Final, Thank you final all thought. for. Final thought. We are taking this to other states because the rest of the United States will eventually jettison marijuana prohibition. There is no doubt that marijuana prohibition is on its way out on the ash heap of history, just like the communist system that it's based on. All right. Thank, thank you, you, Ram. Thank you, Jeff. All right. We'll let the debate continue. Uh, I want to thank I want to thank Sean Boyd and Rob Corey for being a part of this, and and for your, all of you that attended today's full symposium. We'll have that online as well as resources. We'll email to you. But thank you so much. God bless you.